Thanks for tuning in to the Grid Daily Startup Show podcast. I'm your host, Philip Lanos, and we're going to dive into the world of startups, from conception to funding to scale-ups and exits. These interviews are going to run across all industries, with entrepreneurs sharing their best stories, mistakes to avoid, and even their wildest entrepreneur moments. So without further ado, let's start. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Grit Daily Startup Show. I'm here with Heather Terry, and I'm super excited to have you on. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Philip. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. No, you know, when I was looking over the information that was shared with me about your background and what you were doing, one of the first things that crossed my mind was, Heather, do you remember the first time you wondered where your food and products came from? Yeah, I actually do. It's so funny. I was just talking to somebody on the phone about this and I hadn't thought about it in a while. So there was like a, I grew up in the Midwest. So there was a pretty big disconnect in food in the Midwest. I was, I was a part of a, you know, a family, immigrant family, um, both parents working, both parents working blue collar jobs. My mom cleaned houses. My dad worked in the steel mill. Um, my sister and I were really latchkey kids, right? So our parents were working. So we would let ourselves back in, walking to and from from school, um, really hanging with the neighborhood kids. And my dad, when I was 11 years old, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which at that time had no cure. And he struggled for 11 years until he passed away when I was 22. And it wasn't, it wasn't until very, very late um, in his life, which was the early 2000s, that he stopped to ask himself the question, could the food that I am eating be part of the problem. And he asked that very intentionally. And I remember my dad who, you know, Chicago guy, uh, South side of Chicago guy, like meat and potatoes kind of guy, like zero vegetables, like trying to get down the broccoli, (laughs) you know, through in the middle of treatment. And, you know, and I think my mom and my sister and I looking and being like, look, you know, (laughs) you you should probably enjoy a little bit because this is not, maybe not the time to be doing this. He was really more closer to the end of his life at that point. But but the question stuck with me, right? He he discovered it so late. And I think in the 80s and the 90s, right, uh, in America, we were really part of this food industrial revolution where people were microwaving so much of their food and there was very little nutritional value in the food. I mean, I don't know about you, Philip, but like we would, you know, eat canned beans and when fresh beans were available, right? Canned corn. Um, my mom would steam broccoli, uh, not broccoli, cauliflower with an inch of its life and pour breadcrumbs and butter over it so that we would eat it. And it was delicious, but had like no nutritional value on the planet. And so that question for my father at that stage in his life, when he had tried everything and starting to see the research and see, you know, consumers start to take a turn into a different way of thinking and him sort of starting to go along in that thinking late in his disease, um, was really powerful for me. And that was, you know, I was then in my twenties in New York city. I had my own purchasing power versus my, the purchasing power of my parents and my family. And that was a really influential moment for me to say, okay, do I stop at the bodega or do I go to, you know, this thing called Westerly market? Like that seems interesting. Oh, there's some weird stuff I've never heard of, you know, but there was also the dawn of the internet. So that was useful. Right. So it was really, um, it was really then that I started to consider it for real. Okay. Now you're, that's when you're considering it. At what point do you begin to think to yourself, I can be a part of this change? Yeah. So that was a couple of years later. So I started that like health journey when, after my father died and I was cooking a lot and I realized, you know, as much as I love going to eat out in New York city, which is like the most beautiful adventure of your life to live in your twenties in New York city and eat at every restaurant you possibly can cobble together as much money as you possibly can to go have that culinary experience. That was like my hobby for a long time. But, you know, um, I was also an actor in New York. And so uh, those were limited experiences to me. So I thought, okay, well, instead of continuing to eat ramen noodles like I was in graduate school, why don't I try to do something in my home that, that makes sense? And so I really started that. And that was really the dawn, right? Even in our country around celebrity chefs and chefs, you know, the food network and, and all of that, right? So it was an exciting time because so much of that was so interesting for people. And I kind of jumped on that and started doing my own thing and experimenting. And I was really lucky to 
obviously have places like the Union Square Farmers Market in New York City and really start playing with ingredients I had never heard of, right? And um, and that was really how it started for me. And then I thought, okay, I want to teach cooking classes to my peers because a lot of my actor friends were like, well, I have no money. I need to stop eating out. I want to be healthy. I have restrictions. I have this, I have that. So I started teaching them. I started teaching them how to cook. And the one thing they would not eat was dessert. And I was like, you bastards, like, why won't you eat desserts? <laughs> and they were like, well, because you know, our figure, Heather, we all are on television for all this and all that. And I was like, okay, great. Um, you only run 15 miles a day and like do Pilates and whatever. You're not going to eat it. So I'm going to create something. They were like, but we love dark chocolate. And I was like, oh, dark chocolate. So when YouTube had like 10 videos on it in the beginning years of YouTube, I went on and learned how to make chocolate on YouTube. And I started making these like 70 to 80% cacao chocolate bars for these classes I was teaching. And then I was doing a show on Broadway at the Walter Kerr Theater um, in New York. And I started bringing in iterations of that chocolate to my castmates. And that was right uh, around the 2008, 2009 housing bubble. And Lehman had collapsed and we were doing a show on Broadway and things were very contentious. So I thought, Philip, why not just go start a company? That sounds like a really good idea. But what I learned in starting that company is that during a recession, which that was a true recession, not like this made up recession that we've created um, for ourselves and everybody's panicking silently over, even though nothing's really happening, um, is that people would buy two things in a recession, chocolate and lipstick. And so chocolate was very successful during the recession. And Jennifer Love, my um, co-founder and I at Nibborn, were very successful in bringing chocolate, healthy chocolate bars to the market. We were the first non-GMO project verified chocolate bar ever in the United States. And that's what we did, you know, and we were very uh, lucky despite ourselves to, uh, to be in that, in that part of the industry. Now, when you began this, is this when you filed your B Corp from the beginning? Did you know that you wanted no. to be that? No, so there was no, was there? No, B Corp was really small. So B Corp started in 2008, I believe. And so it was very, very early days of B Corp. No one really knew what it was. And certainly we didn't know what it was because we were first time food entrepreneurs. We had no clue. We had no point of reference. We were starting completely from scratch. I mean, selling things to people online in 2009 was right. like, what is this like gonna that was not that long ago by the way like it sounds so long ago but it was really not that long ago that people were not buying food on the internet at all like very short period of time ago so um we we knew we wanted to do good that was very hard at that time because the way the food system it's still set up you know good sam transcends that but the way the food system in our perception at that point in time was middlemen brokers aggregating product, aggregating ingredients to get to your end producer to make the product that you were making. That was the only lens we could see through. In addition, as we started getting into the field and we started going to farms and seeing the supply chain for Jen and I, we were two of the only women doing it at that time. Wow. There were no women in supply. It was like a boys club all the way around all day, every day. And it still largely is to today. It's just that I'm deciding that it's not that anymore. And I'm taking all my ladies out to the, out into the fields of Colombia and Kenya and all different types of countries. Um, so it was just hard because we didn't know and we didn't know how to do it. And B Corp was, I, I mean, it wasn't even on my radar. I don't think until like 2015 when I was, when I was getting out of the first business. So it, we knew we wanted to do certain things. We were very disenchanted by the way the industry worked. We did everything we could at that time with what we had. And it gnawed at me for years. And when I got to creating Good Sam and deciding that... So we, you can't file to be a B Corp uh, on day one. But what you can do as an entrepreneur who believes in ESG, social mission, circularity, equity, equality, all of it, is you can set your, your company up as a PBC, a public benefit corporation, which essentially infuses the ideology of B Corp into your actual operating agreement, your shareholders agreement, all of your legal documentation. So you can do that many, many years before you become a B Corp and hold your board and your shareholders to a certain social um, and planetary standard 
without a B Corp certification. So we did that at Good Sam. And then two years into Good Sam, we started our B Corp application and we got it last October. That's amazing. Not enough companies uh, are doing that. And it's because it's a lot more difficult to run a company that way, just because there's <laughs> actually standards, right? Has that impact? And legal standards, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. legal stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. quite literally. And yeah. has that impacted the kind of people you can approach or who are interested in investing in you? I mean, you know, the, the sure. venture capital world and, and those investors, they're not looking at companies the same uh, then as they maybe are now that everything's going mm-hmm. green and everyone, well, as you said. Ding dong, I'm here to tell you, you're all thinking it, but nobody's brave enough to say it. Venture capital and the world of CPG food is pretty much dead. Um, it is. It was never meant to be here in the first place. It does not fall into the model of how margins work in food, how retail works in food. It is a completely impossible model that was set to a standard that never should have been brought here in the first place. So food entrepreneurs are going to have to start getting really clear about the type of money that they want to take and the path that they want to take, or they will just continue to go out of business, um, which is what's happening right now for a lot of companies, because they relied on that top line at all cost for a very long time. The suits came in, said, this is what you must do. Don't run a sustainable business. Run this top line at anything. And that's not possible in the majority of food CPG businesses. In fact, I would say almost any, right? Unless you have deep, deep pockets of your own, and we won't name names, but there are definitely companies that have done that and look like they're Cinderella stories, but they're actually not. Um, So, you know, those first time entrepreneurs out there, those entrepreneurs who don't come from means, who don't have that big setup, don't be too hard on yourself. Be focused on running sustainable, profitable businesses from day one. That is so, so important. The tide is turning. Things are changing in the CPG narrative, um, especially around food. Um, Understanding that these models that have been superimposed on us from tech do not work. It is not a one-size-fits-all solution. First of all, I really appreciate you sharing that because a lot of people are trying to get into the business. They have a passion Mm -hmm. similar to yours, Mm -hmm. trying to improve the foods that are available at the grocery stores. And they often think, well, I've got to go get money, you know? And as you said, Mm -hmm. especially if you want to make a company that has a level of integrity and legal liability that yours does, you can't necessarily go out there and find some big venture capital firm to invest in you when for them, it's all about returns as soon as possible. Exactly. not the way that works. That's where we were going. So yeah, it has, it, it obviously changes who shows up at the table and, you know, I think for a little while at the beginning of Good Sam, I was wasting my my time with a lot of VCs. And then I just stopped. I was like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you guys, actually. <laughs> and then it was interesting to see them all want to talk to me. I was like, no, 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 no. We're not taking money from your, like your strategy is not our strategy. And that's okay, right? We just have, we have a different way of moving through the world. So for us, it's been, you know, mostly a lot of impact investors, angels, industry, um, people who fundamentally want to change the food system. Right. And aren't in, uh, they also know that um, there's not going to be a huge hurry to do that, that those things take time. And uh, those things take time. Those those things really do take time. Right. And so let's get into it. What is, if you had to say in a couple of words, what Good Sam stands for and what people who are listening right now need to know about it, drop it on us. Yeah, so Good Sam works solely in regeneratively farmed systems that help with carbon drawdown, are very good for the planet, directly with farmers. So we have no middlemen in our entire supply. And because we believe in regenerative agriculture, Philip, we work in those systems to develop those products. So our cocoa and our coffee grow together, our macadamias and our mangoes grow together. So Good Sam's portfolio spans four categories chocolate, coffee, nuts and fruits. That's incredible, especially to know that you come from making a couple of chocolate bars to now you're working with farms and directly with people impacting. And if I remember correctly from what I read, you also make sure that the farmers are taken care of. And that's a whole other side of things, right? Well, yeah. So just really briefly on that, you know, obviously there's fair trade, fair trade like a lot of certifications have come come under tremendous amount of scrutiny. We know that that Groups that are that are doing performing these certifications have a lot of bureaucracy in them, so a lot of the money doesn't actually trickle down to the communities in a way that makes sense. And oftentimes, the money that does trickle down gets dictated into certain buckets that maybe the community doesn't need to grow or to have fundamental 
um, you know, rights like water and things that they really need. Uh, so what we did was we just stripped the model of that. We said, we're going to pay the fair trade premium. We're going to pay the women's premium. We're going to pay the organic premium. We're going to do all of that directly with you. That 1% that we would have paid a fair trade group to basically license the label on our pack, we're not going to do that. We don't care about putting it in our pack. We're just going to do the right thing. We're going to take all that money we would have paid them and we're going to come back to our farming communities and say, okay, guys, you're our partner. You are truly a team member of Good Sam. What is going to make this business of yours and your community better? What is going to strengthen the fiber here? What's going to move the needle? So we've built roads, put in solar panels, electric power lines, internet, clean water, bathrooms. Um, we're working now on compost toilets, so many different projects that you know we really meet the community where they are. We make sure that that project can fundamentally be taken care of by them for the long term because you know a lot of groups come in and say, oh, you must have this and then it breaks and there's no way to make it better. So really looking at it holistically, how do we treat them like our team? You know, if the water cooler were broke in the Good Sam office, we would be able to replace that. Yeah. So why not give them something they can also replace, maintain, repair um, and, and have in order to help grow the business, the community and the, the fiber of, um, you know, the, their heart, soul and passion, which is farming. You know, Thank you for sharing that. I, I think uh, one of the most important things about conversations like this and having the opportunity to speak to someone who has done this much growth in their own personal life and, and in the business world uh, with, uh, with the kind of approach that you've brought is I don't want to miss the opportunity of asking, you know, often businesses will share their stories and this is great because this helps us understand where you're coming from. Often every business still faces challenges or obstacles where they wish another type of company would have shared the same values existed. So since this is a startup show and they're listening, maybe looking for their next opportunity, thinking of their next move, what would be an incredible ally for what you're doing with Good Sam and yourself, Heather? And, and how can the listener maybe start that company in, that way, in a perfect mm -hmm. world? Yeah, so we talk a lot about, and you can see lots of interviews by me or, you know, publications where I talk about this. We want as many companies doing exactly what we're doing or iterating on it to make it even better, right? Um, as many as we can, everywhere, anywhere. You know, our team, find us all on LinkedIn, ask questions. You know, we may not get to it right away, but we will get to it. Start networking with people that are doing this work, the team at Good Sam and other companies that are doing this type of work as well, right? There's a lot of really amazing companies out there um, doing different types of work in the field in supply. We call it supply networks instead of supply chains. Um, but in those supply networks, just write, you know, what's the worst that could happen? They don't write you back. Write them, ask questions, test out ideas, you know, join masterminds and cohorts of individuals that are talking about these topics. That's where the real change happens. Um, but I encourage you, it's hard work. It's very fulfilling work. Um, but uh, the people who are doing it will share with you what they are doing and uh, give you opinions about what they think works and doesn't work uh, in different places. Okay. And now uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be closing and wrapping things up. And I yeah. appreciate that. Uh, first, sure. I want to ask you, is there anything that you're currently looking for that the listeners should know about in case they can put you in touch with someone or something of that nature? And then Money! <laughs> <laughs> okay, drop if it on you us. you know impact investors, family offices, people who are passionate about the space who want to come and join our investment team. We are looking for them. We're raising a very small round of capital, but we'd be happy to have them discuss it with them. And um, they can reach out to me at heather at goodsamfoods.com. Okay, right on. That's what I was looking for. Heather, I can't thank you enough for actually opening up, especially with the kind of question I asked to open things up with here on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. It's been a pleasure having you on. The pleasure has been all mine, Phil. Thank you so much. Thanks again for listening to Grit Daily Startup Show. I'm your host, Philip Lanos. And I got to tell you, I'm very grateful to be able to do this. And I'm grateful that you sat through and listened to this conversation. I hope it brought you the insights you needed or the inspiration you needed to get up and get going. Big shout out to Jordan French, founder of Grid Daily. Can't wait to do this again. Be sure to subscribe. And for whatever you do, please leave us a review. That's how this show grows. And we can continue to bring you conversations just like this. Until next time.